Let's see. Okay, we got some people coming in. Angela, Emily. Hi, Emily. Um, Catherine. Hi, Rebecca. Uh, oh, Stephanie Silver. I uh, see some familiar names here. Hi, everyone. As you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, I know a lot of you are going to be from Connecticut. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, let us know. Let us know what town in Connecticut. Let us know what town or state you're in. Uh, what brought you here in New Orleans? Awesome. Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Shout out to Lane. Hello. <laughs> Derby, Connecticut. Simsbury. Oh, and as you put in a mess, uh, messages in the chat, just make sure to put it um, for everyone. Because if you put it for hosts and panelists, not everyone can see it. Mm -hmm. um, unless you Carol Lee, uh, College Park, yeah. Yeah. Hartford. Okay. yeah. Hartford, awesome. We're at about 40 now. So we'll just wait a few more seconds for people to come in. Uh, Chester. Well, yeah, Uncasville. Yeah, a okay. lot of people from okay. Connecticut. Those are all Connecticut towns. <laughs> hey, Florida. <laughs> Oh, St. Louis, Tucson, D.C. Okay. Okay. Yep. yep. Emily's in Maryland. I, I forgot. Yep. Shout out Howard County. <laughs> Some hey, people. Somerville, not far from me. Yeah, right next to David. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's get going. Um, hi, if this is your first time here, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the literary program coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum here in Hartford, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us for this virtual program for the Stolen Wealth of Slavery, a case for reparations. Virtual programs like this are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are grateful to honor his memory with these programs. And I also want to thank our members. I know there are uh, at least a few of you uh, here tonight. Um, but if you're not a member, please consider supporting our museum by becoming a member. Um, there are so many benefits to becoming a member. Um, you'll receive free or discounted admission to author programs, uh, the House and Museum, year-round discounts in the store and cafe, and much more. Uh, you can visit our website for more information or just um, send me an email. Uh, so this program is co-hosted with our friends at the Amistad, Amistad Center for Art and Culture and the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. Uh, first, the Amistad Center, which is uh, oversees an extraordinary collection that documents more than 300 years of the artistic, literary, military, enslaved, and free life of Blacks in America. The Harriet Beecher Stowe Center's mission is to encourage social justice and literary activism by exploring the legacy of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Their vision is a world in which engagement leads to empathy, empowerment, and change for good. Um, now on to our guests. Our author, David Montero, is a journalist and producer. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, Harvard Business Review, and more. He is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships. His first book was Kickback, Exposing the Global Corporate Bribery Network. Our moderator, Dr. Christoph Mergerson, is an assistant professor in the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. His research interests include journalism history, race and news media, and journalism and democracy. Prior to Maryland, he was a researcher at the Brookings Institution. During this event, we encourage you to have a conversation with each other in the chat. If you have a specific question though, please post that directly into our Q&A section. That's a different button, a different area. It's on the bottom left of the screen. So just click on Q&A and ask your question. And you can ask your question at any time, whenever it comes up, you don't have to wait until the Q&A section, which will start in about half an hour. Um, so that is all for now. Um, please sit back and enjoy, and I'll turn this over to David and Christoph. All righty, thank you so much, Omar, for that introduction. Welcome everyone um, to this event, and welcome to our guest, the author, David Montero. Appreciate you being with us tonight. David, thank, thank you, Christoph, thank you. Thank you so much. Before we even get into the book, let's talk a little, a little bit about your background. So you've been an investigative journal journalist for many years. You, you're an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker. You've written, produced, and directed documentaries for 
Frontline on PBS. And as Omar just mentioned, you wrote a book in 2018 about the impact of corporate bribery by companies from the global north on communities in the global south. I wonder if you could set the stage for us tonight um, by telling us about that first book and what you found, and then we'll segue into this book. Yeah, and actually there is a segue. So that first book, I just a quick backstory. I had been a foreign correspondent in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Cambodia for many years. I saw firsthand the fallout when bribes and, and, and illicit money are paid in countries like that. And so I wrote this book to capture that fallout. But that book put in my mind the idea that the story of money, of wealth, lives a diabolical afterlife long after the news or, or or we lose sight of it. The money is paid, you know, we sort of think end of story, but that money is like a character that goes on to have a very evil life, seeps into various layers of society, and you can follow it, and you can follow the damage, the fallout, and sometimes that takes decades. The, the fallout falls out, the, the, the fallout plays out over decades. So I... It, it put in my mind the idea of a model for looking at um, investigative stories through that lens. Follow the money, obviously, but wealth as a character. Where does it end up? Where does it go? What do people do with that money? And as I found, if you trace that money, if it's a large for Fortune 500 company that's paying bribes in Bangladesh, somebody might say, oh, whatever, you know, who cares? Actually, that money, when you follow it, I found it funds terrorist groups. It, it, it bankrolls autocrats. So you have to keep watching that story and watching it unfold. And actually, that is the lens, money laundering, the fallout, that I then brought to this issue of enslavement and its profits. You have a skill set that really is um, perfectly designed to do this kind of research. And speaking of that, so like you said, in a sense with this book, you're essentially doing a forensic analysis on what happened to the profits earned by American institutions from slavery since I believe it was 1790 um, in your book. So you're literally following the money to figure out the state of those fortunes today. Tell us a little bit about your research methods. How did you go about researching this book? Yeah, well, the quick back backstory to how I even stumbled upon it was my wife one day mentioned to me as we were walking that Lloyd's of London According to a newspaper report she had seen, Lloyds of London, a multi-billion dollar corporation in England, had disclosed in 2002, after the murder of George Floyd, that it had been involved for centuries in enslavement, in profiting from and financing enslavement. And they knew that because they had records that showed it, and they, dis they decided to disclose those records. So I was just all this book we talked about kick back and my wife is telling me this and a light bulb goes off in my mind for two reasons first i thought hang on a second a multi-billion dollar corporation like lloyd's of london has records about its involvement in enslavement and b they've just been sitting on them and they're, they're not you know now all of a sudden they've disclosed this I started wondering what other major corporations in america for example have records like this can you look at those records so I started to do that. And, you know, the, the story of enslavement, the conventional story being what it is, I started looking in the South at Southern plantations and Southern people, Southern families. And I, I quickly realized that the story was pointing me increasingly North, North, North. The profits were flowing North. The people who made this money were, were in the North. And the more I looked, the more I found that there were business records of corporate directors at major banks like Citibank and Bank of America and the Bank of New York, their corporate records were sitting in libraries and archives. Some of them were digitized. They were at the New York Historical Society. And they showed these white people's, white men's connections in a very, very deep commercial way to Southern plantations, to shipping cotton, to even being uh, repaid for debt through the sale of enslaved people. So I, I looked at as many of these kinds of records as I could. The New York uh, Public Library has a massive amount of records pertaining to one figure who I'm sure we'll talk about later. And so I started, yeah, that's what I started doing. I started just following the money through those records. So now let's go ahead and, and turn to your book directly. So before we go any further, I wanna ask you 
to basically define what you mean by the term reparations. I mean, as a professor, whenever we talk about a new topic, um, I want to make sure that I'm on the same page with my students, that we understand um, what is meant by a certain term. And we hear that term often, but um, perhaps we can take its, its meaning for granted. So from your perspective, what are reparations and what are the purpose of reparations? I think reparations are more than one thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think they include cash payments to black Americans, and I will come back to that. Mm -hmm. They also include an acknowledgement of, of a fundamental history in America, a history that has largely not been acknowledged, especially by corporations. Reparations are an attempt on multiple levels of society from mul multiple stakeholders, institutional players to repair the, the harm done through centuries of injustice to black people. So uh, first and foremost, as I said, I think this, this has to begin with an acknowledgement of history, an apology for that history. I think it has to take the form of direct cash payments to black Americans. It has to take, the, and that starts at the federal government, but is not only the federal government. It also has to include corporations, state and city officials, institutions, family foundations. It's a broad swath of society that has to be repairing this harm done. And there are many ways to repair harm. Some of it is money. Some of it is acknowledgement. It's investment. It's a, it's a whole program of things. So in your book, in the introduction, you lay out your main argument. And it goes something like this. That this and you kind of touched on this, but I, I want to highlight this, that the story of how slavery in the United States produced these fortunes that were essentially unprecedented in global history, not primarily a Southern story, which is interesting to me as someone who grew up and lived in the South, um, but rather it's primarily an East Coast and particularly a Northeastern story. Explain for our audiences what you mean by that, because that's a, that's a very interesting insight. I think understandably our gaze on enslavement has been focused on where black people were coerced to work, to, to labor, where they produced that wealth. But if you actually look at, if you what I tried to do was look at the totality of the story and, the, and part of the story is the flow of that wealth out of the South. Enslaved people were making billions of dollars worth of products, not for the South, not that stayed in the South, but that were shipped annually to New York, to Philadelphia, to Baltimore and then put on ships and further shipped around the world. So we have, I, I think we have, again, understandably, attention focused on the plantation, the Southern enslaver because of their diabolical, wretched behavior. Um, but as I did this research, I noticed, again, uh, two things. The, the, the money, when you follow it, points north. And I also noticed that abolitionists, Southern enslavers themselves and observers at that time, the time of enslavement, were saying the same thing. Slavery is not making the South rich. It is actually impoverishing the South. Why? We can get into this in a minute. It's because sure. plantations borrowed and borrowed and borrowed debt and financing from Wall Street banks and Boston banks to make this whole system run. And so when I looked at enslavement, I wanted to say we should look at it as a wealth generating system. And if we do that, who actually made the money? You have to look outside of the South to, to arrive at that answer. Yeah, so we're definitely gonna get into some of these points and even thinking more broadly, you know, David, when we think of slavery, we think of plantations, you know, woodlawn plantation, Maidwood, Whitney, so forth and so on. We might also know about the names of the families that owned and operated these plantations. We might think about, and we should think about, I think, the enslaved people um, who liberated themselves and worked to liberate others. We might think of the Confederates who fought to keep this all going. But what we might not think about very often, and I certainly wasn't taught you know, where I went to school, um, we don't often think about, when it comes to slavery, names like Bank of America, New York Life, Lehman Brothers, Brooks Brothers, Citibank, Aetna. Why is it important for us to know and think about these companies in particular and others like them and the men who um, you know, derive their fortunes from these companies? Why is it important to know those names along with the other names that we hear about when it comes to slavery in the US? 
a couple of reasons. One is I think we should understand the institution of slavery being a wealth generating system for white people, essentially a business, would not have functioned without those northern corporations, northern names that you just mentioned. Um, those northern corporations, those northern men were just as complicit, just as involved and profiting just as much, though they, they escaped the burden of censure, the burden of, of being outed, whereas a lot of attention was put on southern, southern plantations and southern enslavers. So they're part of the story. They're, they're an indelible part of the story, especially when we look at the wealth and who made it and what they did with it. And that is important because... The, the, the system of enslavement may have ended in the South, and it may have ended in 1865, but these corporations and those men for decades leading up to the abolition of slavery and the Civil War were investing money from enslavement, investing profits that they were making from enslaved people's labor into industry, into other corporations, into our the coal fields of Pennsylvania and railroads. My point is that money never died. It never went away. It was transmuted by those people in, on Wall Street or in Boston into forms of institutional wealth that still survive. So we should know who they are because I would argue they're the primary beneficiaries of this diabolical system, this heinous system. And the wealth that they created hasn't ever gone away. It still lives on. If you're just joining us, we're here with author David Montero, the author of The Stolen Wealth of Slavery, A Case for Reparations, which you can find now wherever books are sold. David, let's talk about some of these characters that we've been hinting at. So you write about how Manhattan grew into essentially a global financial center, thanks in large part to how its businesses supported the slave trade during the early national period, those first decades or so. Um, starting with George Washington's presidency and extended into obviously the middle of the century. You write about some very interesting characters in your book, and I think it's important for people to know that. It's not just a, a, a forensic analysis. It's actually a, a very um, intriguing narrative. Tell us a little bit about some of the individuals who made this all happen, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I, these were, in a lot of cases, very young white men. I mean, they were in their 20s. They were in their 30s. Some of them had moved to America from England. But it, it, the reason I say that is it underscores the incredible power that young white men had at that time to shape the de destiny of millions of people and the, the way we thought about capitalism, about commerce, about politics. So what, what a lot of these men did was they started out as merchants on Wall Street, and, and that meant that they owned a ship. And in America, at the birth of the Republic, the way you made money on Wall Street by owning a ship was you primarily you transported the things that enslaved people in the South made. And, and before the 1800s, that was tobacco and that was flour. But in the early 1800s, it also became cotton. And when cotton exploded as a global commodity, these men with ships started sailing to southern plantations and saying to enslavers, hey, I have, I have not only ships to sail the cotton that you're now making your enslaved people uh, cultivate, I have loans. I'll lend you money. And enslavement and plantations were expensive to, to, to grow cotton, to buy enslaved people, to ship these commodities, cost a lot of money. And so these merchants showed up and said, well, I'll lend it to you. And in return, I'll take cotton from you when you grow it. And if you can't assure to me that you will sell me cotton, I'll take the enslaved people, you know, working on your plantation as surety, as a bond. And that's how the system developed. So as these men at first owned one ship and started uh, transporting cotton and got richer, they bought many ships. And with many ships, they started taking the wealth that they were uh, reaping from slavery and started investing it into corporations around them on Wall Street, insurance corporations, banking corporations, and, 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 and on and on until there was an institutional basis funded with seed capital from the profits of slavery that became many of the banks that we now know today. As you mentioned, Bank of New York, Citibank, Bank of America. I mean, I think that's, that's particularly an interesting insight that we're not just talking about middle-aged men who were responsible for, you know, taking advantage of the system. These were the young entrepreneurs of their day. That's, I think it's a really important insight. 
Um, and it did not take long for slavery to contribute to these men's riches. And in fact, you write early on in the book, quoting, it can safely be estimated that between one third to one half of all the bank directors of Wall Street by 1815 were directly profiting from the enslavement of black people and that the sale of the commodities black people produced um, from Southern plantations was a central pillar of their operations. That's that's an astounding, astounding statistic. That's that's pretty amazing. Um, it, it's also, I think, fascinating to note, um, which you do in your book, that while there were some plantation owners who absolutely made fortunes from slavery, I mean, you touched on this earlier, but I wonder if you can expand, that most Southern enslavers, relatively speaking, were not rich. Why did they not capitalize, pun intended, on slavery to the extent that Northern businessmen did? Why weren't their fortunes as substantial? Uh, uh, a couple of reasons. Again, enslavement was very expensive. So to buy enslaved people required cash. A lot of these enslavers, especially when they started out, did not have the cash, so they borrowed it. And they, if they were in places like Miss, Mississippi in the 1830s, where there were not many banks, they had to borrow the money from Wall Street because there was no other local, there, there wasn't as uh, an abundance of local banks to borrow from. So it was it was expensive to to run a plantation and it, the other thing is that it was it, it's this is the foundation of the term predatory lending toxic debt wall street was mm -hmm. making it very easy for these people saying here you know don't worry about paying me today pay me tomorrow here's cash to buy more enslaved people here's cash to buy land and many many people fell into that vortex of of toxic Debt. I mentioned just as a quick aside that Thomas Jefferson, a you know, the, one of the founding fathers of the nation, died in debt to a Wall Street bank because he had, from a very early age, he had borrowed money and he had, as he himself put it, he had poorly managed. It started off as a couple thousand dollars. By the time he died, in today's terms, it would have been a couple hundred thousand dollars. So even somebody like him had fallen victim to Wall Street's credit. So. It, it just became increasingly difficult for, unless you were a plantation with a hundred or more enslaved people, the, the, the economics of this system, getting your product to market, paying for the insurance, paying for the bailing of cotton, the shipping, the, the warehousing, those were all run by corporations, corporations, by the way, in New York. It just became prohibitively expensive. And so the way you did it was you borrowed and then that meant you fell into debt. Again, as you mentioned, many there were perhaps 4,000 enslaving families who did make a lot of money. And that's that's not a small amount of families. But mm -hmm. relative to the fact that there were probably something like 700,000 families in America who enslaved Black people, the people at the top really making the money were the 1%. And that's not the narrative we're commonly told, right? We're com Of course, we're commonly told that yeah. a lot of that wealth was accumulated down south. Um, I'm just curious as someone who, um, you know, I'm just obviously just down the road from, well, I guess like half an hour away from Baltimore anyway. But the, you made clear that the wealth flowing from the South wasn't just going to New York. It was going to Philadelphia. It was going to Boston. It was going to Baltimore. Um, so they profited from, you know, transporting cotton and their dealings with enslavers. But you write that by 1820, New York really had suppressed their cities in terms of their cotton exports. I mean, is there any, what's the explanation for why New York got the edge um, in terms of building up that industry as opposed to Philadelphia, Boston, or Baltimore? Why did why did New York become essentially the epicenter of all this as opposed to those cities? And a couple of reasons, but the main reason is because New York had the best harbor of any of those mm. cities. It had a deep water harbor. That harbor had existed, you know, you can imagine since colonial times, it had the facilities for large ships and it had the, the the tradition, the institution of those large ships sailing to England, which was the primary market for cotton. So part of it was history. New York got lucky. But part of it is the figures we're talking about, these guys from New York, from Wall Street, who went and they pioneered this concept of easy credit. And they also created a revolution, some of them, um, in the way shipping of cotton and shipping of enslavement products was done. And so they captured the market basically by being young and being cutthroat. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think it was that New York had a couple of historical advantages and, and it had a quickly accumulated capital because of this, this amazing harbor that it had had long before other places. So, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you talk about, you know, financial ruin resulting from these loans and things. So the thing I think about is the Panic of 1837. You know, mm -hmm. again, we learned in school it was a financial downturn. People were ruined. It was a gloomy time. You know, it, was, it wasn't a great time in American history. But what we for sure did not learn that one of the major contributing factors was that the cotton market essentially was a bubble that burst, putting the entire financial system um, of the country at risk, basically. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Panic of 1837 and just expand on mm -hmm. that about, you know, how the, you know, I think you kind of hinted at that, but how, you know, that went down and how, um, I think one of the more interesting aspects of that was that Northern businessmen themselves actually gained ownership of a slave people. So if they had an indirect tie before then, they really had a direct tie now. Yeah, I would say that researching this aspect of the book was probably what felt like um, the most meaningful and eye-opening part of the book. And I say that because I started reading very old newspaper accounts from the 1830s. And I was reading about the expansion of the new frontier of slavery in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And these newspaper accounts really opened my eyes because they talked about the flow of enslaved people from the upper slavery states to these new frontiers. And, and again, Mississippi as a, as a state barely existed. It had to be created as a, as a plantation, as a labor camp zone. And what these newspapers pointed out, which I had also never read about, they, 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 they ached and they marveled and they were, were distraught at the following fact that between 1834 and 1836, thereabout, so in a two-year period, enslavers sold 250,000 Black people. 250,000 Black people in the span of two years sold. This was one of the single largest, most disruptive and cruel expansions of slavery in U.S. history. Those 250,000 enslaved people, these newspapers were pointing out, on average cost $600. So it means that in a two-year period, white enslavers in the plantation lands newly opening up in Mississippi and other states spent $150 million at that time. So 250,000 Black people times $600, $150 million at that time which means something like $5 billion and, and actually much more today. And so what these newspapers were saying was, remember that the, the enslavers in Mississippi, Mississippi being almost a blank slate, had no money. They, they didn't have the money to pay $150 million in this transaction. Where did they get it? They borrowed it. They borrowed it from Wall Street banks and they borrowed it from Boston banks and they borrowed it from banks in Baltimore and New Jersey. And so by the time of the collapse in 1837, and as you pointed out, this collapse, many factors contributed to it. I'm not a, a, you know, a scholar on that sure. collapse, many factors, but sure enough, part of it was the rampant borrowing, the easy credit, enslavers borrowing and borrowing from Wall Street and saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to overproduce cotton at a huge price. And when the price of cotton actually collapsed in 1837, so many of those plantations, those enslavers who had borrowed and borrowed money from Wall Street had nothing to sell, or at least they could not sell at a rate to repay their debt. And as you point out, one of the fallouts of that, which shows the interconnectedness of enslavement to Wall Street, was that Wall Street was, was, was totally disrupted as, as an institution. Merchants by the thousands were disrupted. Many went out of business. Those same newspaper accounts at that time calculated that it, Southern enslavers owed New York banks alone $100 million. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. And and so, yeah, it, this was very disruptive to slavery. Oh, excuse me, very dis disruptive to enslavers. But as you pointed out, a lot of people, as they always do in these kinds of financial collapses on Wall Street, a lot of people came out ahead. Certain enslavers actually 
benefited from consolidation, from collapse. They gobbled up plantations. They gobbled up business lost by other people. And one of the, I talk about him in my book, James Brown, the, the, the patriarch of a, a firm called Brown Brothers Harriman, which many, many people know still exists today. It's a multi-billion dollar investment firm. James Brown, after the collapse of 1837, became, according to my estimate, I think the single, one of the single largest enslavers in American history with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of acres of plantation land and several hundred enslaved people who became his property because he foreclosed on plantations that owed him debt. So from Wall Street, there's James Brown, arguably the most powerful banker in the world, controlling a series of plantations. I mean, it's it's just mind boggling. I want to say to our audience that in about 10 minutes, we'll start taking your questions. So if you want to go to the Q&A window uh, at the bottom and type in a question, we'll try to get to it. Linda, I see your question. We'll address that shortly. Um, others, if you have questions, please feel free to chime in. Enjoying this conversation with you, David. Let's talk about mm -hmm. the American Colonization Society because- uh, Oh, wow. <laughs> if, yeah, in my journalism history class, we talked about this. So if any of my students are watching, this is what we were talking about. Um, yeah. Let's talk about how they, their role in commercializing black bodies, which I didn't know. So when I read that, I was like, wow. So for those of you who aren't aware, the American Colonization Society was founded in 1816. And the whole point was to encourage free, free black Americans to leave the United States and immigrate to West Africa, um, even though many of them had been born in the United States. And this is because while some white Americans found slavery to be distasteful, they didn't necessarily believe that black people deserved to be deserve to have equal rights on par with them. And in fact, there were some Black Americans who thought, we're never going to get a fair um, deal here in the United States, so maybe we do want to do this. So um, the Black community was split on that. If you know about the history of Freedom's Journal, the first newspaper, that was one of the reasons why the editors split, um, because over one of the editors' support for the American Colonization Society. So David, you write that some of the biggest supporters of the ACS were Wall Street businessmen. Why? And what did they have to gain from this, especially since some of those merchants, as you mentioned, were actually involved in enslaving people themselves? Yeah, it, it, it is such a convoluted, complex, I mean, mind boggling scheme, the, the, the colonization society. And what boggled my mind further was was learning how much corporate directors of major institutions and banks on Wall Street really were the ones running it at a, at a managerial level. And the reason for that was they, some of them, maybe in their hearts really believed that they were doing something of benefit to the United States. But what they were really saying to Black people was, you should understand that America is not a place for you unless you are enslaved. These Wall Street directors, the bread and butter of their business were Southern plantations, were, were enslaved people. They, that, they, they fought tooth and nail to the very moment of the Civil War to keep that institution alive. And, and they were threatened by the idea of free Black people. For them, there was only one category in America for Black people. You should be enslaved and you should be working at plantations to make us money. If you are free, we don't want you here. And so they actually, I, I thought it was important to point out not only how Wall Street made money from enslavement, but what they did with this money, because it showed their mindset. It showed um, it showed an ethos that they created from a very early period in, in, in the history of our country. And that was, again, saying denying to black people the possibility of America as their home, There's certainly the possibility of citizenship and equal rights they put a lot of money behind this idea and literally uh, chartered boats and sent thousands of black people across the seas away from america never to return again that was basically the 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 mm, the deal that they made with with black people was you can be free but you have to leave it, there was no other option and so it to me it really crystallized that these corporate directors, though not in the South, not enslaving people themselves, though some of them did, they they were um, the leading white supremacists and white nationalists of their day. And they put a lot of money behind the, the entire scheme of white supremacy as it unfolded at a very early period in America. 
that puts a whole new um, perspective on this idea about the backward South, doesn't it? Because that's what you, that's what's often heard that the South is this backwards place that's incapable of reason, um, and yet you have people who are putting together a scheme like this um, along the same lines. Just about everybody knows who the KKK are. Um, many of us with Southern roots or knowledge of Southern history, we know about the, you know, the Citizens Councils or the Council of Conservative Citizens, which by my way of thinking was basically just your friendly neighborhood plan, plan in business suits, you know. Um, but perhaps not many of us have heard about the Union Safety Committee that was established in New York in 1850. And it's in A, it feels like they were every bit as odious as those other groups. And B, it, it feels like they... Um, incorporated the, or had, were um, featured involvement by the same uh, businessmen that you spoke of. Talk a little bit about the Union Safety Committee and why that's important to know about, especially as it ties to business interests in slavery. I, I think it could be argued that some of the most vociferous support for slavery, if not the most vociferous support for slavery, and it, it certainly, you know, from the 1820s, but but especially leading up to the Civil War, came not only or not necessarily from Southern enslavers. It came from Wall Street directors. It came from bank directors. And principally, the the, the president of Citibank and, and, and many directors at Citibank, the directors of Bank of America, the directors of Bank of New York, for, for the reasons that we've been describing, they knew that the, the destruction of slavery would destroy the, the means of their wealth. They hated abolition. They hated the idea, and they said so in very clear terms, repeatedly, in printed word, in, 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 in letters, in newspapers. They controlled newspapers that said this. It, they were so threatened by abolition and the fact that abolitionists were not only talking about eroding enslavement, they were actually uh, ferrying and carrying enslaved people to freedom through the Underground Railroad. So they formed this committee about... A, 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 um, let's say a thousand corporate directors in 1850 in New York City. And we know that because they signed their names to the formation of the union committee, but a thousand corporate directors on wall street created something called the union committee. It later became the union safety committee. And it's it basically, it was created to be a corporate institutional framework to support slavery, to uphold the, uh, the 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 runaway uh, to, to 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 ensure that runaway slaves were remanded back into slavery, and to ensure that the rights of the South to enslave people were upheld. It also wanted to uphold the white race in the event that a civil war pitted uh, white people against free black people in an outbreak of war. Th this was again; these were not Southern enslavers saying this. These were you know, the most powerful and influential, you know, the pinnacle of society in New York City who also happened to be running their bank. So, the, yeah, the Union the union Safety Committee was a prototype of institutional white supremacy, created a structure for it, funded it, funded lawyers, funded propaganda. And really what it wanted to do was destroy the Appalachian movement. That was its main goal in, in America. The more things change, the more they say the same. <laughs> David, let's take some. I mean, really, really, it seems like it does, right? Um, yeah. Let's take some questions here, David. Um, first one, um, Linda raises an interesting point, and I, I think I, I know the answer to this, but I'd love to get your thought on that. Um, she says that we included Bank of America with the Bank of New York and Citibank has profited from slavery, but B of A was founded in 1904. Correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I believe it's one of its predecessors was founded yeah. as far back as the 1780s. Yeah. Can you talk about that? It's a yeah, it's a confusing history because there is a Bank of America that was founded in San Francisco in 1904, but mm -hmm. there was an original Bank of America founded mm -hmm. on Wall Street in the 17, well, by 1790s, certainly. One of the first directors of Bank of America at that time was Archibald Gracie, a very famous merchant after whom Gracie Mansion in New York City, the mayor's house is named. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, th there are sort of two Banks of America. I actually think they are not connected I think the one in San Francisco is is actually not connected, but there there was a Bank of America on Wall Street at that time. It's a very but important a good, clarification. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Natalie asked a question that I was actually going to ask you earlier, and I figured let's just let's hear it from Natalie. 
Um, she asks, what other products besides cotton became the basis of the wealth creation um, that we're talking about? I know there were a bunch of them that you read about in your book. Yeah, and you know, understandably, when when we talk about enslavement and wealth, we talk a lot about cotton. I, I think that there's a reason for that, but but obviously, the wealth created by enslaved people, the the the, the things that they produced for many many years, for for decades, if not centuries, went far beyond cotton. We're talking about tobacco. We're talking about sugar. We're talking about flour. We're talking about gin, whiskey. We're talking about hemp. We're talking about indigo. Enslaved people worked on railroads. They were one of the most important forces in the development of America's iron industry in the South, but also in 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 the North. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, it's actually mind-boggling, difficult to enumerate all the different things that enslaved people made. I try to do, I try to highlight as many of them as I can in the book, but it, it, it certainly is far, far, far beyond cotton, though cotton was a hugely lucrative uh, realm. Absolutely. Those of us who live in Louisiana, uh, I know um, Lisa and others, we know about the plantations that um, produce sugar cane. Which is very popular in the Deep South, so that's yeah, that's definitely something I remember. Um, Kent asks, Hartford is a major insurance city. Um, has your mm -hmm. research dealt into the insurance industry's involvement in enslavement? And we did talk about um, New York Life being one of them. What are some of the other insurance companies that come to mind that people might know about? Yeah, well, the, 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 off the top, we got to talk about Aetna Insurance, and I mm -hmm. mentioned it like one of the pioneers of the reparations movement in America, uh, a woman named. Adria Farmer Palmain, um, who became very involved in, in reparations back in the, in the 90s and, and was, was instrumental in launching some of the first lawsuits in America that tried to hold corporations to account and pay reparations for the history of enslavement. Um, Deidria focused her, her, the first corporation that she ever researched and confronted back in 2000 was Aetna Insurance, which is based in Hartford, Connecticut, and I believe has existed, it might be 1838 or it's 1858. And Deidria had found in their own corporate records that the of the first few hundred uh, insurance policies that Aetna Insurance ever made, I believe a third of them involved enslaved people as some kind of bond or collateral. And so after she found in a, in a public record, she found um, that those details, those facts, she actually went to Aetna Insurance in early, I mean, nobody had ever done anything like this. She went to them in the early 2000s and said, this is your history. You should pay reparations for it. The company did admit that you're right. They they they, they refused to pay reparations. But, but yeah, actually, Aetna Insurance has been around for a long time. And thanks to Deidria's um, efforts, it's also been on the map as being deeply connected to uh, Black people's enslavement. Barry, Kristen, and Elise, and I'm sorry, Elsie, Barry, Kristen, and Elsie are asking questions um, that I think can be combined into some of the questions that I have. Um, so if they will uh, permit me to ask them, I think it will get at what they're, what they're wondering about. Let's, let's kind of jump forward in terms of like how reparations could actually, happen, right? Because I think that's an important thing that we need to cover. And, and again, it covers their questions. Um, I'm going to ask you questions about some objections that people raise, right? About why sure. reparations are a poor idea or why they're unfeasible. And I'm just curious to get your thought on them. So one of the objections that's raised is that even if principle, we were to agree that reparations are the right thing to do, how could we ever quantify the amount that's owed or identify who would pay for it? And worse, what if we could calculate it you put a, there are a number of figures that you put in the book. I encourage people to get the book for that reason if you want to see some quantification. But even worse, it, what if we could quantify it and find that the number would be impossible to pay? And I'll give you an example. So um, in a chapter in the Black Reparations Project, which was edited by William Darity Jr., A. Kirsten Muller, Mullen, and Lucas Hubbard, they used a formula to derive the value of the labor of enslaved Americans from 1776 to 1860. And they claim that the total value of that labor is worth $17.4 quadrillion. That's 1,740 times the gross domestic product of the entire world in 2022. 
So it seems unlikely that number would ever be paid. Um, so what's your response in general to the concerns about the feasibility of even repaying reparations? I think that it's so easy to bog down this conversation in the fees, how and who and how will we ever, um, you know, I just want to say that, you know, before the abolition of slavery, people, and especially white people would say, how will we ever abolish slavery? How would that work? I mean, what will happen to the economy? You know, before we sent a man to the moon, people said, oh, how, how, the how, the how is something that will be determined. It is an astronomical amount of money that is required to address the wealth gap between white households and black households and to, I think, meaningfully repair the damage done. You can't ever really repair the damage that has been done systemically to black Americans. But William Darity also has mentioned the term of $14 trillion. Um, no one is saying that this money has to be paid out tomorrow in one year, in 10 years. You know, the people who are are gasping at the, the feasibility of this, I want to say to them, don't worry, it is not your job to figure it out. Brighter minds are going to figure it out. And they, you know, the, 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 they will, if there's the determination, they will. We have not even gotten to a point where we've, we have um, implemented a body as a federal bill hopes to do to study the issue of reparations. I'm, I'm confident that we will do that. I believe it is the destiny of this country to repair this wound. And so the logistics of it, sure, they are monumental. But there, this is also a monumental crime, a monumental history that requires a monumental response. It's not going to be easy. It doesn't have to happen overnight. It is going to require the federal government leading the way in making payments, but it's going to require, as I mentioned earlier, corporations, state and city authorities, institutions of all kinds. So, yeah, the logistics are not insurmountable. We, It, it can, and I, I believe it will be achieved. And so there are others who say, look, slavery was obviously deeply immoral, ridiculous, obviously a massive moral failing on the parts of everyone who participated in it. But I didn't participate in it. I wasn't alive when slavery happened. I didn't enslave anyone. My family didn't enslave anyone, so far as I know. So why should my tax dollars, um, or why should profits that could have otherwise gone to, you know, share price or what have you, why should those go to reparations? What's your response to that? It is tr it, it is true that no one alive today is personally responsible for enslavement. That does not mean that the United States is innocent. The United States is more than the sum of the people who happen to be alive and have committed crimes at a particular time. That that that's the glory and the burden of our citizenship. That we are we are not responsible for what happened in the past. We have the opportunity, the capacity, the moral duty to address it. So yes, your family may have may have had nothing to do with enslavement. That doesn't mean the country that you love and believe in is innocent. Moreover. The, peop the people responsible for enslavement are all dead. The system of enslavement is, technically speaking, gone. The wealth is not. The wealth lives on. The wealth has been compounding in interest for decades and centuries. It forms the basis of institutional wealth that corporations and, in and, and families and, and the, pu the public, generally speaking, enjoys today. And that's why I think we all have a role to play in uh, addressing the the wound and you know i the idea that oh why should it come out of my taxes i i'm not an expert on the issue i don't know that it's coming out of any your you joe's taxes first of all um and second of all that's again the burden but also the opportunity of american citizenship we all end up having to contribute to things that necessarily are not our primary belief but that's that's the fabric of our country. That's what it means to be an American citizen. I don't think it's coming out of your taxes, and I think that it, it's a collective responsibility that you should you should. It's a it's patriotism to want to bear this responsibility and heal this wound. And as Tanahisi Coates and Michelle Alexander and others have pointed out, um, while slavery itself as an institution um, has passed along, the vestiges and the consequences and the complications in the form of Jim Crow. Um, in the form of incarceration um, still exists today. 
Lisa in New Orleans asks, if a student who was inspired by your research and teaching um, came to you, express an interest in similar topics that they wanted to research involving the historic systemic theft and collective wealth um, from North American indigenous nations, let's say, what advice would you give them to begin their follow the money research journey? So if someone's interested in studying this with other populations, particularly Native American populations, what advice would you give them on how to go about researching this? Yeah, I, 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 I mentioned in my book, and I, I, I wish I had more time to spend on it. I wish I was more of an expert on it. The first theft of, of, of the first theft, stolen theft in America was land, was indigenous people's land. Without that theft, the, the slavery could not have expanded the way it did. So what I found and what I would say to them is um, uh, Wall Street companies, northern companies, corporations, and many of the same directors I've been talking about and mentioned in my book also formed land companies that lent, that went out west and went to indigenous people's lands in the 1820s and the 1830s throughout the expansion of slavery. And they did the same thing as I've been describing with plantations. They lent money to people to buy indigenous people's land, to kick indigenous people off that land. So there, you could follow the money, and, and some people have, you could follow the money through those corporations. There's a corporate nexus between indigenous, the theft of indigenous land and corporations on Wall Street, corporations in the North. That would be, I mean, you know, a, a gold mine of a place to start. So to bring things full circle, people are going to go out, they're going to get the stolen wealth of slavery, a case for reparations, wherever books are sold, and they're going to read this. And what would you as the author, what do you want people to take away from reading your book? I, I want people to shift the, 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 the narrative that they've, um, the conventional narrative, especially that white people have about slavery, first of all, that it's something that took place in the South and it enriched the South and then the Civil War came and the money disappeared and end of story. I would like them to see how this, the story of enslavement is much broader than the South. In fact, it involves the North and that means us. That's our, that's a history that has largely been untold. And I want them to see that the wealth, because it flowed to the North, because it was mostly captured by Northern corporations, survives. It survives the corporations that still exist today. So that means something about the enduring after effects, the fallout of enslavement, how it's affected people's lives. So I would like them to think of, uh, of, 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 the, of the, the impact of slavery as something that is, is still affecting our society today. It's at the root of income inequality, racial disparities. It's at the root of the wealth that we all as a country enjoy. And that is that that is facts backed up by the fact that these corporations still live today. So I'm hearing that we have just a, just a few more minutes. So um, if it's okay, why don't we take a few more questions? Does that sound good? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So I think Cheryl Dixon raises a very interesting point. So there are corporations today that are building for-profit prisons. Um, mm. And the people who are uh, producing those products, the incarcerated people in those institutions, um, they don't receive a fair wage, if, if anything, obviously, for their labor. So is there a connection between that practice and some of the banks that we are talking about um, from your book? Are they financing those efforts? Oh, oh, today, you mean? Well, yeah, I today. do yeah. not know. I do not know that. That would be a fascinating thing for Please, somebody, if, if they haven't out there done that research. What I will tell you, though, is that many of the figures that I point out, when enslavement ended and, and after the abolition of slavery, what they started doing to make money and to continue exploiting black people was invest in convict leasing in the South. The, so, the you know, many of the largest enslavers were people on Wall Street. That's how they started. That's that's the business that they started running when they couldn't directly enslave black people was convict looting. So there's a long history of um, uh, people in prison being exploited. Whether or not corporations today are doing that, I, I don't know the answer to that. That is a fascinating question. And I hope, hope that somebody is, is, would look into that. Angela Reit makes a comment that I think is interesting to think about because there have been reparations in American history that have been paid to other groups. Um, Japanese Americans, because of the internment under the time of President Reagan comes to mind. 
Um, Alana says, what are your feelings regarding the potential can of worms that some say could open with reparations only to black people? What about native peoples and et cetera? Um, you know, what, 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 well, a can of worms, we're already in a can of worms. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that can's I, been opened, I think. Yeah, that's, America, yeah. yeah, I mean, America's one big can of worms. So, I mean, look at the dysfunction. Look, we could go on and on playing out today. So, and I, I think, you know, somebody also asked me this question recently. Well, where does this end? You know, if, if, if reparations are made to black Americans, then we have to talk about reparations for indigenous Americans. Good. We should be talking about that. That why why should these are injustice these are injustices that made the United States into the superpower that it is today. It it, it you know you, at some point you the, the 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 bill so to speak comes due for the the atrocious behavior that led us to this point. So yeah, I, I absolutely think that the indigenous people have a claim for reparations. People in the Caribbean have a claim for reparations and are starting to, to, to make that claim to the UK and to the Netherlands as they should. This is the basis of the modern world as we know it. It, it, it shouldn't have constructed the modern world on this disgusting foundation. It's time to rip it down or, or rethink it. Yeah, it's a massive project. Good. You know, I find the fatigue with, with dealing with moral injuries to be very interesting. I mean, as an, you know, as just a regular Joe person, I feel like if somebody, um, you know, runs into my car, if they spill hot coffee on me, if they are clumsy and they break my leg or whatever injuries they cause, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to want some sort of compensation or some sort of, of remedy for each of those things. I'm not going to say, well, you know, you've already dealt with the broken leg, you've already done that, let's not do any more. So I, I always find the arguments in terms of like, where, where will this lead to be interesting? It will hopefully lead, like you said, to, you know, more justice feels like it's better than, you know, than, than less. Okay, so, yeah. Um, let's see here. Let's let's do one more question. Um, do you, th don't you think that this, so this is Christine's question. Don't you think that the subject of reparations should be simultaneously considered with the profound systemic economic and legal injustices that currently exist. And from my point of view, I feel like the the clear answer to that is yes. I mean, the worst thing we could do is um, compensate people in whichever form that takes, but continue to keep systems or structures in place that continue to produce injury. So what do you think about that? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is this is based in history, but it's also based on a continuum. This history led to structures and practices and, and an ethos, especially of doing business, that leads us directly up to the income and racial disparities of today. So yes, it is absolutely connected. I mean, meaningful reparations acknowledge that and address that. And that's yeah. That that the, the the point is to is to look at the sweep of history that starts with enslavement, but that that continued up until the the, the present day. All right, let's do one more question. We'll do one more. Um, yeah, because Alan raises something I think is pretty interesting. And this uh, so Alan's question basically was, um, did Mandela have it right with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And you mentioned this earlier. You alluded to this earlier earlier that um, former Congressman John Conyers for years since 1989 offered HR 40, which essentially was an effort to say, let's study this issue. Um, let's be rigorous in our study. Let's figure out what we ought to do. Let's figure out how we want to do it. But that bill has never been passed through Congress. Um, it seems like what Alan's talking about, it seems like what Congressman Conyers tried to do uh, would be a productive thing but what's what are your thoughts on that yeah and let's remember you know that that bill it, it has been making its way for for a long time since 1989 and you know it it, it ha there is progress i mean 250 members of congress have committed to voting for it you know it it's never made it to a vote on the floor but you know in 2000 four percent of white americans supported reparations today it's something like 18 to 20 percent okay not huge but, you know, then the needle is moving. And, yeah. And 
Um, I do. Yeah, I think there are some people who would say, well, what do we need a study for? And and they, you know, uh, for various reasons, they would say that. I think the 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 benefit of the study is to be, as you said, very rigorous about looking at this issue and being very so that people can't poke holes and say, so a study is critical because then you can you can very clearly document here's the problem here's the size of the problem here are ways to address it and you know the the the, the thing that I learned in in uh, reading about the reparations paid to Japanese Americans is that when you actually start to hold hearings about this issue hearings that lead up to a commission and then a report and a study it brings a lot out of the woodwork the visibility is powerful for people and for the issue. And so that's that's another reason to do it. David, it has been an absolute pleasure to spend this hour with you. I, I cannot stress enough to those of you who are watching, I strongly urge you to get a copy of this book, The Stolen Wealth of Slavery, A Case for Reparations. Um, it's an amazing read. It's a very thoroughly researched book. Um, and I think You'll learn a you'll learn a lot from it as I certainly did. So David Montero, thank you so much for spending time with us thank tonight. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was a really amazing conversation. Um, thank you, David. Um, and I'm really excited to, to read this book. Um and uh Christoph, thanks again for your amazing yeah, thank you so much as moderator. It's a pleasure. We'll have to do this again. Yes, yeah, <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us please pick up um david's book the soul and wealth of slavery you can do th that through our museum store um and join us for another event in the near future uh and thanks again to our friends at the almastad center and the still center have a great evening thank you everybody thank you thank you